You know, I grew up in Seattle, so my inspiration comes from this place. We spent a lot of time in the public market. You know, just the atmosphere there is really, really cool. My parents would bring me there on the weekends. Using the glass to create a totem pole, it's just really scratching the surface in, in some ways of the possibilities. Pioneer Square is part of my original inspiration, I think, seeing those totem poles down there. Everything that I wanted to do was happening here, you know, between music and the glass, community that grew up around me. I can't imagine not living here. You know, the connection that I have here in, in the city with the glass community, it's really exciting to be able to realize this piece. My reaction when I first saw it in person stacked up and I mean it was really just unbelievable. It's sort of like your jaw just hits the ground. The reaction to this piece when I've shown photographs of the object to other glass makers and friends and other artists from other fields, it's always the same. Everybody just says, no way, no way. How could you do that? No way, who did this? No way, you know, it's like no way is what everybody says. I wanted to create this totem form because I wanted to venture into that monumental sculptural quality. And the Clinket culture is about monumentality. It's, you know, and the materials that we use, like the cedar trees, are becoming increasingly rare. The new materials are going to be adopted. You know, they're going to be steel or, or you know, concrete or who knows what. For me, the, the glass also is a transformational material. It's transforming from a liquid to a solid. For our tribal community, it's also a transformational medium that is breaking the anthropological viewpoint. The first step that we took was I engaged my friend David Svensson to carve the totem pole out of cedar log straight a line as we can get up as far as we can and maybe have the head kind of like more um, separated from that line. If, say if it comes up to right here or just to, you know, mm -hmm. and then what they'll do is they'll actually polish the entire back. And you'd be surprised how much the, the polishing, you know, and, and grinding to a, a high polish allows a lot more light to come through. Yeah, like I mean, Preston's fun to work with because he leaves it this open so we can try a variety of ideas, what the killer whale figure might be, whether he's diving or folding over or wrapping around another character and so forth. So that those are the fun design compositions that we can play with and, and uh, come up with. And once we get the basic shape happening, we can fill in with details of maybe uh, Subclan, the wolf or Thunderbird. Or my opportunity of going north to Alaska. I saw this ability to work with your hands, which was absolutely incredible, and how, you know, the, uh, 
Tlingit people made these objects that are usually utilitarian, but so artful and so beautiful. And My career as a glass artist has sort of morphed into being a cultural ambassador of so, to some degree. We thought about, about doing the, this little exhibition. Right, a gla incorporating glass with the yeah. carvers up there, where they would carve an example and we'd somehow get the piece cast in glass or, and then have a small show at the at the uh, Sheldon Museum in Haynes. And that was really the start of the Fusing Traditions exhibit. You know, and that led to, what, the Pilchuck Totem Pole. Yeah. I think we were returning from the glass show that we had. He says, you know, I thought, you know, Pilchuck should have a totem pole. And I, I wrote to them several years ago, thinking that would be kind of a cool thing to honor the founders of the school. And so There was an interest in, in uh, Northwest Coast culture yeah. at that time at Pilchuck, you know, and you were surely one to introduce that. And, uh, well, I tell you, it was like an epiphany for me. Like when I was like, I, I realized that my career was really coming up and I thought, you know, this would be an amazing thing to have happen up on the campus, a place where it was, uh, you know, the, my, I kind of discovered myself and as, as an artist and what have you. And, and then to have David come up there, we, were, we went up there and taught, co-taught a class surrounding the, the totem pole carving. And then, and we, so the students were helping us with details and glass casting and all of this. And there's... Um, Backlit with neon. Yeah, and then we did the, you know, brought the, like the northern lights into the piece, you know, the neon, multicolored neon tubes. And, and it was just really, really cool. I mean, for me, it was like the, all the, the planets were aligned and it just all... For many, know, for many know. people. Joe David was there and he was running sweat lodges and we were going through all the, a lot of people just went through these amazing kind of transformations. The piece uh, is kind of a family story, and it's actually my great-grandmother who had a pet grizzly bear as a child. Uh, so I knew her, and we spent a lot of time around her, and yet I grew up, you know, fairly urban, urbanized, you know, and not really connected to my, my native roots. In the form itself, is the central figure is my, represents my great-grandmother, and it's a, you can see it's a female figure. She's shown holding a copper form, which denotes that she was from a, a, a noble family. And then it has the clan symbols, which would be the eagle, and then the killer whale, which relate to our family background. I knew of Charlie's involvement with the, uh, the Czech glassmakers, so um, I asked him if he'd uh, do some inquiries and see if we could get the project done over there. A studio that translates to mean glass, Novotny, uh, it's a father-son team with some excellent, excellent people. These uh, are, are basically extruded rods of glass that come out of a special furnace. Once the color was decided by Press and his client, then we had to make sure that there was enough of this material to fill the mold. So now they're going to bring it down to a temperature where the glass just begins to harden and stops moving. And that begins this long, long cycle down to room temperature, which will take 10 weeks. Five people will start to extricate the forms from the uh, two kilns that they're being melted in. and then the whole process of breaking away the mold.
uh, pressure washing the objects. And then finding out really what the, the nature and the quality of the glass is, then that begins to take place. It does take you by surprise how much luminosity it has. There's a serious side to it that you don't expect when, it, when you see the object in full form. I just love the fact that here the glass is capturing the texture of the wood. So it, you, know, you look at it and you wonder what is happening here? What kind of tools were made to make this finished glass piece? It was just something that's really kind of hard to put into words, really. And I think that the, the client that uh, got the piece was was equally uh, as impressed. I think one of the things that was really cool is that when we first went and we looked at it all together with the Czech team and Charlie, we came in and he said, okay, now check this out. So he turned out all the lights in the house and the lights from the city still kind of came up through the back of the piece and illuminated it in such a way that it, it still had this kind of ghostly effect. Even in the dark, it had this, this uh, life uh, inside it, you know, from the city lights, and it was really, it was spectacular.